so yeah, what, what is correction? Right? Um, the purpose of the library is to provide a uh, well-structured JSON data format for a wide variety of like, ad hoc correction factors that you might encounter in a typical, typical HEP analysis and sort of in a companion tool um, suitable for use in C++ and Python programs to evaluate them. And so we're restricting ourselves very narrowly to um, you know, class of functions with scalar inputs and, and scalar outputs. And the main purpose of this, uh, this narrowing definition is basically we wanted to encapsulate the wide variety of different data formats and tools that were um, found within the CMS collaboration. This is where this, this tool was sort of born out of is the need to condense all the different various end stage analysis scale factors into a common format so that it was more easily uh, distributable and, and more easily reproducible so that different analyzers could get the same uh, the same results with the same uh, with the same inputs. Um, and so higher level things like you know correcting Lorentz factors is out of scope. We're just focusing on scalar functions. So if if you like in Python, the signature would be some very variable number of arguments that are integer float or string type and returns a floating point value. And then you know in conjunction there's a C++ signature that looks something like this you know, using C++ 17 features like standard variant. Um, there's many different kinds of function classes. I'll try to go over them a little bit briefly in this in this notebook. Um, but basically, it boils down to multidimensional bin lookups, bin looking, lookups pointing to multi-argument formulas with some restricted math function set, um, categorical go maps like string or integer enumerations, some transforms, pseudo-random number generation, and, and compositions of the above. Um, and with these set of uh, function classes, uh, we found it was enough um, uh, enough richness of, of uh, descriptive um, format that that we can encapsulate basically all of the end stage analysis uh, correction types that we see in the CMS collaboration. And so the collaboration is now moving towards describing all of its uh, end user analysis corrections in this format. Um, so the basic usage for, for a, an analyzer uh, that's using the evaluator is basically um, you, you import some previously defined set of corrections from a file or from some string that you, that you grab somewhere. And these are just, this is just a JSON file. There's absolutely nothing um, special about this file. I'm just going to open it just to show you what it looks like. It's just standard JSON with uh, you know, standard types. And, and this tool will, will read that in and give you a list of the available keys in the correction file. Um, each one has you know, some various metadata, like a name, a description, a version, and what the input and output types are. And these are all programmatically accessible um, through you know, attributes of the objects. So you can see, for example, this correction called Gen2 to Gen1 has two inputs, one PT and one ADA. You can probably guess what those mean. Um, and then this other one has some various other one, it, other inputs. In a little bit here, I'll show you uh, another way to present the same information that's a lot, a lot nicer looking than this sort of uh, um, programmatic access. Um, of course, most importantly, you need some way to evaluate it. And so in Python, that would be, for example, evaluating a correction like this, this phi mod correction, which you don't know what it is yet, but um, let's just say we know it has an input of phi and input q, and if I uh, evaluate it with that input, so I get an output. And how to interpret that will depend on the metadata of the correction. Um, the input types are strict in the sense that they aren't coerced, um, and this is sort of on purpose. So for example, if q was a floating point number instead of an integer in the above example, um, I would actually get a runtime error that the input has the wrong type. Um, and this is on purpose to basically make sure people are applying corrections properly to the proper inputs and, and just you know, avoid bugs by catching them early. Um, and you can see here, you know, if I change it to zero, this particular correction doesn't have um, anything defined for the value of zero. And um, when it was made, it was decided that this should raise an error. We'll go into this a little bit later, but you can actually choose how to deal with uh, out-of-bounds inputs. It depends on a case-by-case. 
Of course, evaluating it at for single uh, sets of arguments is not going to be terribly efficient in Python, although in C++ that's just fine. Um, so of course we also allow vectorized evaluation where vectorized is in the sort of Python sense where you pass a NumPy array and under the hood it's doing uh, um, evaluation in the C++ library uh, efficiently. And so this um, correction called PT weight is being evaluated on a um, length 10 array of random inputs and it produces a length 10 array of, of outputs. Um, currently, uh, any NumPy compatible awkward arrays are accepted, uh, but Jagan arrays could be, uh, for example, flattened and, and applied and, and unflattened. Um, we're working still on, on making this uh, work for any awkward array type. Um, uh, awkward just recently provided some uh, um, some hooks into their API to make this a lot simpler, so we'll start to look at that soon. Um, but for now, you can, of course, flatten your arrays, apply a weight as we did before, and then unflatten the array to get a jagged array if you need that. So that's all I'll say for evaluation for the moment and kind of go into exactly how a new correction would be made. Um, so uh, correction live separate from the evaluator has a complete JSON schema that defines the expected fields and types found in the object. This is something we focused on early in the design is to make sure that whatever file type comes out of this tool, um, that it can be completely described by a JSON schema. And so that did um, mean that some, some ways in which you would arrange the data look a little weird from a naive point of view, but to make sure that it is actually uh, validatable by a JSON schema, we had to, had to uh, uh, do this approach. And the complete schema is defined in the documentation. Um, and then in the package, we actually use this tool called Pydantic, uh, which is essentially a Python validation library um, that uh, uh, has a one-to-one -one correspondence with, with JSON schema in terms of support. So we're able to basically write Python classes um, that then get converted into JSON objects that conform to the schema. And as you build the, the classes, you can be assured that they, they conform or are con course to be uh, conforming to the schema. Um, so here what we do is <clears throat> we make this simple correction object. This is schema version two. We give it a name, a version, what the input is, um, and then what the output is. And then right now, for simplicity, the correction always returns a single value. It always returns 1.1, no matter what the input is. We'll see in a second how we can change the data to, to be more complex. Um, this object could be manipulated in place to you know, change the definition, to add do, new nodes to the, to the data uh, tree. Um, and you can also uh, convert it straight from the schema to an evaluator with this sort of shortcut expression. And you, know, you can see that no matter what I put in as my input, I'm always gonna get the same output because that's the data that's defined. Um, and now finally, we can see a much nicer printout through the use of the rich library. Um, so this is much easier than the programmatic axis I was showing before. As you can see PT weight, which has no description. I could add a description up here if I wanted. Um, and then it has a description of the inputs and output and what importantly what the output means. And this will depend on your correction. Sometimes you'll do a multiplicative event weight. Sometimes you'll do a additive shift to a quantity or what have you. It depends on, on the use case. So of course, the, the main point here is, is this data node that we need to fill in. And that becomes a root node of a tree of objects defining how the correction is to be evaluated. Um, in the first example, it simply terminates that this node just says, okay, always return 1.1. But we can switch in many different node types. Um, there's binning for 1D bin variables where each bin can be itself any type. Multi-binning uh, for nested 1D binnings. This is an optimization detail. We have category type for discrete dimensions. We have formula for basically arbitrary formulas and up to four real or integer valued input variables, sort of a, you know, in the spirit of, of T formula. Uh, formula ref is an optimization where you have the same formula, but many different coefficients. And this can be up to you know, several thousand. There was a particular use case in CMS where there was a, um, a bin formula, basically a spline, if you like, 
uh, that had up to 8,000 formulas. Um, and so having this, this formula ref optimization saves a lot of space and evaluation time. Um, there's a transform node to sort of rewrite input as you go through the, the tree. Um, and then most recently, we added this hash PRNG. Uh, so a de deterministic pseudorandom number generator that's useful for um, smearing like activities, which I'll show in a little bit here. Um, so here's a, a bin correction where I just have, you know, a binning with some edges and content. Um, and you can see this is all in the data node. And uh, you see when I start adding nodes, I get a bit more information in my output, like what the allowed range is and whether overflow is okay. You can configure the flow behavior. Um, the flow could be either clamp, as in clamp to the nearest bin edge, error, or it can also be any other downstream node type. So you can even implement a whole new binning in the flow variable and, and have that, you know, as um, the evaluation descends through that node, it says, oh, this is outside the boundary. Okay, evaluate this downstream node to decide what to do. And that's very useful for things like uh, doing special handling of systematics when you're out of the nominal range. Um, so you can see here, it just clamps to the highest value since I'm over the, the range. Okay, formulas. Uh, formula support currently is a mostly complete subset of the root library T formula class, but it's actually implemented in a standalone thread safe manner. So this library is self-contained, does not depend on root or, or in fact any other library besides NumPy. Um, the parsing grammar is formally defined and parsed through a, a parsing expression grammar library. Uh, for those of you that are interested in this, it's uh, you might be interested in the details of how it's implemented. Um, it allows very fast parsing of thousands of formulas encountered in, for example, spline correction types like I was talking about before. Um, and we demonstrate here, it's a very simple formula for some made up uh, correction. And you can see now that the <clears throat> correction is getting more complex, you start to see, you know, the, uh, the description is getting quite large. So you have a category, which is deciding this Q value, this charge that we uh, we're demonstrating earlier, and depending on whether the charge is one here or negative one, um, you get a different formula. Um, so one for, say, positive charge, one for negative charge. This is just a made-up correction. It doesn't necessarily um, correspond to anything that you might find in practice, but it demonstrates that, you know, you can write an expression and have it evaluate on, you know, a given input variable. Um, and again, you get this nice uh, rich representation. And if you convert it to an evaluator, of course, it, it runs just fine. Um, you can see right now, um, if I if I set the charge to zero, um, it'll it cause an error because that was not one of the categorical values that I listed in my in my category node of the correction. But if I wanted to, I, I could add a default. Uh, behavior. Um, for example, I could return, say, uh, 1.0 in a case where there was no category key corresponding um, to the input value for Q. Um, and you'll see, actually, when I do this, uh, the, the input here definition will change slightly. It now says it has a default. So now if I run this, it should be okay with that and return the default value. Okay. So very often you'll want to convert straight from a histogram to a correction object. Um, so what I'm doing here is basically showing that you can convert from any anything that respects the unified histogram interface protocol. Um, so that includes things like TH1s or anything in the HIST package. Um, here I'm, I'm demonstrating uh, creating some mock data uh, into two dimensions, let's say a PT and ADA dimension. And I fill it with just random you know, pseudo random values. And so you can see there's these, these two data sets. Let's pretend, for example, it's two different generators, Gen 1 and Gen 2. And one has this PT spectrum and the other one has the other one. And we'd like to derive a correction as a function of this 2D variable such that, you know, it reweights uh, events from Gen 2 to match Gen 1. Um, and so this is what this is doing. It's basically just grabbing the histogram's values, dividing them, and then setting it to one anywhere where we ran out of statistics. Um, and then here I'm using a little shortcut to display it by um, putting the data back into a, a hist object and, and displaying it. 
And so you see, you know, here's what the correction value, the bin correction value looks um, like. Um, and if we want to convert that to something that we can actually use, we can use this uh, convert that from histogram utility. Um, so first thing I do is I give it some more metadata, like the name and the label. And then I call this from histogram, and then I give it a description here and also tell what to do with the overflow bins. Um, in this case, I'm saying it's okay if it's out of bounds, we'll just clamp to the nearest available correction value. And so now I have a correction and let's see what happens if we apply it. So I'm gonna generate some more mock data um, drawn as if it were from the Gen 2 distribution. And I'm gonna use the HIST library uh, to fill from that mock data, but with a weight now um, where I'm applying the, the weight that I just uh, derived. And if you look now, you can see that uh, the, the second generator after reweighting looks much, much closer to the first generator. They're statistically compatible now. Um, I see that I'm, I'm getting close to my 20 minutes, so I might uh, get a little brief here. Apologies for that. Um, one thing you might want to do, um, you know, it's apparent from the plot of the 2D correction factor above that we don't really have enough uh, sample statistics to derive a, a smooth correction, right? You saw that this, this histogram doesn't really represent a, properly the, the ratio of the likelihoods of the events from the two different generators. It's an approximation and it does do a decent job uh, of correcting things, but you may want to do some sort of fit to that. Um, and I sort of imagine that um, this correction live could be a natural home for deriving, um, for including tools to help, you know, create these sorts of fits, how to, you know, like take some you know empirical distribution and turn that into a proper you know a proper model for how you want to do the reweighting um, and so this is sort of the first uh, the first tool in, in that library towards that end um, and it's simply just an n-dimensional polynomial fit and it allows you to basically take the let's say the centers of the grid of bins that i just uh, created in the uh, scale factor histogram and then um, fit those bin centers and their bin values with some, some estimate of the variance and produce a, a polynomial that's a degree two in PT and a degree two in ADA. And so that's what this does, um, this ND polyfit. And it also includes a little bit of information about the fit result in the uh, documentation of the correction. So you can see now I have this correction um, that is fit to the polynomial. The fit status actually uh, was a success. It managed to fit. You see the chi-squared is reasonable, um, a little suspicious, suspiciously good, uh, but nevertheless, you know, we can now apply this correction that is a um, order 2-2 two -two polynomial um, to the input, and see, let's see how that does. And so this polynomial reweight in red, it's, the plot's getting a bit crowded now. You can see that it also seems to make uh, Gen 2 look much more like Gen 1. Um, and maybe you, know, you would hope that it has uh, some better, better performance in the, the rarefied areas of the correction because this is just a PT projection, not seeing the ADA. Um, so yeah, that's how you can you know, derive a polynomial fit. And I think it would be nice if this package could start to collect you know, various approaches like this, you know, for example, um, you know, splines or what have you. Um, I think it would be a very interesting way to uh, sort of condense our knowledge about how to do these things into, into a package that is distributable. <clears throat> okay, one, th one small like uh, note that I wanted to make is that, you know, the polynomial um, evaluating this basically order K in the, in the order of the polynomial while looking up a value in a non-uniform binning is you know, order log n in the bin. So depending on the situation, actually, fitting a polynomial may give you better performance. Um, I'm going to demonstrate here that within correction lib, uh, actually, it is slower uh, to evaluate the polynomial. So you can see for uh, 10,000 values that I was using to reweight this plot, um, you can see that the, uh, the bin correction evaluates in 400 microseconds, uh, whereas the uh, polynomial evaluates in something like four milliseconds. Um, 
but you know in some cases like in this, this sort of toy example you can see that the, the the inverse is true so if i do search sorted which is the you know basic primitive operation of doing um, a bin lookup you can see that it's actually slower than using the numpy polyval okay um <clears throat> So one of the newest features of Correction Lives is, is this um, hash peer ng, um, and this is for resolution models. Let's say you want to smear a variable like a jet energy uh, to simulate the degradation of resolution with respect to what was expected from simulation. Let's say the data has a lower jet energy resolution, for example. Um, if we can deterministically generate suitable random numbers, then we can use them after suitable scaling to correct these uh, values. And the reason why we want it to be deterministic is so that every time you rerun your analysis, you get the same result. Um, but you would like it to have you know, all the desirable pseudorandom statistic properties just without the fact that it changes every time you run. Um, and another thing you'd like to be able to do is not have it change depending on the order in which you process events, which is one of the big fatal flaws of using sort of a traditional approach, right? Where you would seed a random number generator at the beginning of the run and then sample from it but then it depends on the order of events. So you'd much rather have a deterministic pseudorandom number generator with the entirety of the entropy sources that are giving you the pseudorandom number are coming from properties of the event itself. And so that's what this um, uh, hash PRNG node is for. Um, it's basically a node that takes an arbitrary number of inputs. Um, <clears throat> and so here I'm basically just compiling a various set of inputs that are giving me entropy sources. So like unsmeared jet PT, the jet kinematics, the event number. And what it does is it uses a um, extremely fast um, uh, hashing algorithm to generate an integer seed, which is then is used to initialize a random number generator that is uh, designed for high performance uh, with uh, quick seeding. Uh, and so, you know, you put all these things together and you actually have something where you will always get the same number out um, for the same input, um, but the number has statistical properties um, that you know simulate whatever distribution you choose. Um, and there's a few different distribution choices, um, including standard normal, flat, and actually a, a self-implemented normal distribution. Because to my great surprise, the C++ standard library random number generator um, specification does not include a strict specification for how the number is to be generated, only that it's to, to you know, uh, produce normal distribution in, in high statistics. So, you know, Marsalia method versus Ziggurat versus the various other ways you can sample from a normal distribution. It's not specified exactly how it's done. So in principle, depending on your implementation, it may change, which is why we have our own custom one. If you want assurance that this will always produce the same value on every platform. In my testing, though, I found that it doesn't seem to be uh, varying. Um, so anyway, we can apply this, and you can see that indeed, you know, I'm smearing something out. <clears throat> um, it's not normal here because I purposely made it um, scale the the smearing value depending on where I'm at. But if I were to, for example, um, just uh, look at the random number generator itself, it should be a perfect Gaussian. Yeah, so that looks Gaussian, at least Gaussian enough. Okay, in interest of time, I'm just gonna skip this compound correction. It's basically just a way to simplify applying several corrections in order, um, and then go to systematics, which is just to say, um, there are many different ways you can encode systematic uncertainties. Of course, all of these corrections in a real analysis would come alongside with a uncertainty. Um, and there are no dedicated nodes to the task, but we'd love to hear your input on, on how we could create a dedicated systematic node. There's an issue uh, early on in the development to discuss this. Um, for example, the most straightforward method you can do is just, you know, add a new category node type that, you know, uh, adjusts how things uh, behave. So, for example, in my earlier PT weight example, I could insert a category node called SYST. And if the systematic is called muon efficiency up, then I provide a different uh, binned correction value than for the nominal uh, uh, multiplicative event weight. And so that way, you know, this, um, when I evaluate for nominal, it's the normal. 
and when I do mu on the efficiency up, I get a slightly different value. Okay. Um, last but not least, you can compile these into a set of corrections and write them out into a JSON or a gzip JSON. Um, in our tests, we found that actually gzipping JSON, the resulting file size is competitive with um, basically the file size of earlier formats, even, even binary formats like root files. Um, compression works very well, even when you're compressing JSON. Um, last but not least, for those of you that uh, work in C++, there's a command line utility that provides some useful tools, um, in particular, including how to uh, generate the necessary flags to uh, compile a C++ program against this library. And just to demonstrate here, I have a simple C++ program where I load you know, that gzip JSON file I just produced and then evaluate one of the corrections. Um, and depending on your platform, you may have to add some extra variables. Um, linking is challenging, um, but sure enough, it runs and produces the value we expect. So thanks for your time, and I hope this gives you a nice overview of what the correction library, correction li library uh, use case is, and uh, hopefully you find it useful in, in your analysis and, and can contribute back and help us build you know, a common language for corrections. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. This was a super nice talk. Um, uh, so I think we have time for basically like one question. Um, I'll I'll just go ahead and also echo Jim's uh, statement on uh, on Slido that uh, that correction lib is a it seems to be a really nice example of a declarative domain specific specific language. So uh, great work there. Uh, and then we have one one uh, question, which is. Uh, the corrections are often affected by statistical uncertainty stemming from the calibration sample size. Is there a built-in way to propagate those? Yeah, so currently, no, we don't really provide any um, prescription for how to deal with um, systematics. I mean, I, I would include the sample size for deriving a correction as one of the example, statist uh, example systematic uncertainties that you would have to propagate. Uh, and no, we don't have a current currently any built-in solution, but I think it would be interesting to, to think about what we can do to, to build that in, especially, for example, in that polynomial fit, for example, you could imagine that that tool would not only produce the central value for the polynomial fit to the, uh, to the ratio of event weights, but actually also some sort of uh, uncertainty. And that would be a useful feature. But we have to figure out exactly how to do that in a portable and consistent and proper way. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, I think we're going to move all other uh, Slido questions uh, to Slack, but uh, Nick, thanks again. That was